Hello everybody. Welcome to this webinar on career development for postdoctoral mental health researchers. Uh, this has been put together by a team of people from the NIHR Mental Health Research Incubator and kindly supported by the NIHR and their excellent webinar team. Uh, it's great to have so many mental health researchers here today. Uh, we're reliably informed that over 200 people have signed up to the webinar, so it's really great to have you all here. Welcome. My name is Dr. Rachel Kelly. I am a researcher working in mental health at the postdoctoral level and also a member of the Mental Health Incubator, which is how I've ended up chairing the first part of this webinar today. So the aims of today's webinar, um, we, we set this up because we've all been there and we know how difficult it can be to develop your career post a PhD or equivalent qualification. And so we really wanted to, to help people to think practically what sorts of things they can do to develop um, their careers after um, when they're working at a postdoctoral level and to share our experiences and, and, and tips. So to give you some real life examples of, of, of what we've done, what how we've developed our careers, what has worked well, um, but also what hasn't worked so well or what challenges um, we've faced. Um, hence me putting a few sharks in the water around that boat there. So, so sometimes you don't hear about the things that haven't gone so well, but that's what we wanted to share with you as well, to perhaps help you avoid those or, or know that you're not alone in experiencing some of those challenges. Uh, we'll also cover um, postdoctoral funding, so where you can go for that and some top tips for applying. But, but it's not all about funding by any means, and there's a range of other things you can do to develop your career. So we'll also cover plenty of those as well. And as I said before, we'll then give you the opportunity to ask any questions you've got about career development. Next slide, please. So hopefully you'll be able to see that the agenda on the right hand side maps onto what I've just said in terms of, of what we will cover today. Um, on the left there, then you can see all of our speakers. Uh, everybody is here because they have experience in mental health research and, and most people because they're working at various um, levels postdoctorally. Um, and so everyone has been invited for that exact reason and because they're part of the mental health incubator. Um, in a moment, we'll start with Ruchika and Ian sharing their stories and journeys through their postdoctoral careers. But before I do that, I'd just like to move to the next slide and, and just very briefly mention the Mental Health Research Incubator because I'm mindful it's something that not everybody might be aware of and it's actually something that can be really helpful when it comes to career development. Um, so the Mental Health Research Incubator is, is basically a working group um, and it's one of a series of working groups set up by the NIHR focused on various priority areas. Um, mental health being one of those, and I think that's important to know in itself. So the NIHR is really interested in mental health research and in supporting mental health researchers and their career development. So you've already got a head start there, really. Um, it has a newsletter you can sign up to that, that comes through periodically with lots of useful information and advice around career development and mental health research. And it also has a website, which I've put a screenshot of on the screen there. And I've circled various things in yellow that I thought might be particularly helpful to signpost you to. So the web address is at the top there, or you can use the QR code to get to it. Um, you can see on the top right, there's a section specifically focused on career development. So that's well worth visiting. Uh, then there's a mental health research community map. And that is a map where you can search for and then get in contact with, if you wish, mental health researchers working across the UK. You can search for them by area or by topic they're working in. Um, you can see there's then a section specifically focused on funding for research. And there is even a training and career development program specifically focused on mental health postdoctoral researchers. And that's something you can apply to join. There's so many places available each year. So, again, something well worth having a look at. And then finally, at the bottom, you can see there are case studies for um, researchers sharing their stories and experiences at various different levels and from various different clinical and non-clinical backgrounds. So something else well worth visiting. There's a lot more than the four shown on the screen there. And that leads me very nicely into our first speaker. So Ruchika is going to share her story with you all now of how her career has developed postdoctorally working in mental health research. So over to you and the next slide, Ruchika. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Hello, everybody. 
My name is Ruchika Gajwani. I'm an academic clinical psychologist, and I uh, split my time within the NHS as well as, as a researcher at Glasgow University. I was awarded the MQ Fellowship in 2020. And what I would like to share with you today is really my journey and to encourage you to think that research is possible in whichever setting uh, you are in. Next slide, please. So it's really about wearing two hats, whether you're a clinical scientist or a non-clinical scientist. It's about thinking about how we can have careers in whichever setting we are uh, to pursue research. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, the map of the world. This is my son's map of the world. I'm originally from India and I moved over to the UK 20 years ago to pursue my master's and a PhD in psychology. And very quickly, I realized that actually what I wanted to do in terms of application of my research is pursue a clinical psychology doctorate, following which I moved to Scotland and I currently hold a split post where I use both my research and clinical skills. And within these last 20 years, I have had two maternity leaves, two beautiful children. And what, how this has been possible is really through having beautiful collaborations and mentorships along the way. So yeah, very much having a balance between personal and professional life when you're pursuing research. Next slide, please. I want to share with you the, the pathways within clinical psychology, but this really applies across the board. If you're a social worker, if you're a psychiatrist, if you're an allied mental health professional, or indeed a researcher, I want you to think that usually we are presented with linear pathways, as is the case of psychology. Uh, here is a pathway for a degree in psychology where you can go on to do a postgraduate degree and pursue to be a clinical psychologist. But within this forum are two other, and in fact, multiple other frameworks of pursuing research. So within uh, research, you have the clinical academic role, but also you have the more traditional teaching role of lectureship. In all of these different forums, what we encourage you to do is to have collaborations with your partners, talk to people around you so you can develop questions in order to pursue uh, the, the burning questions you have in mind. So whether you are a psychologist, you're a psychiatrist, at any stage in this, this career pathway, you must be able to form uh, relationships and ask these questions. Next slide, please. So I want to share with you some of the case examples. So uh, there's Linda Russell, who is a qualified clinical psychologist and full-time uh, practitioner. She's currently pursuing her PhD through research funding from the NHS. We also have Dr. Naomi Wilson, who is a full-time psychiatrist and stepped out of training and has recently been awarded the Wellcome Trust Fellowship to pursue her PhD. We have Gary Kane, who's a social work researcher and a full-time social worker who stepped out of his uh, role to pursue a PhD. And all of this has been possible because they have gone back to their tradesmen, you know, to, to ask for time away uh, to pursue research. Next slide, please. This is a very humbling step. It takes an average of 17 years for new discoveries to be translated into routine practice, clinical and non-clinical. So how can we bridge the gap? Next slide, please. I think this is possible by working with collegiate teams. This is a team that I work with in Glasgow. It's called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Centre. We're a group of eight different professionals. There are psychiatrists, social workers, educational psychologists, music therapists, art therapists, as well as speech and language therapists. And what has been one of the biggest learning things for us is that we talk to each other to find out where the gaps are. To have a multi-agency partnership is not only crucial for good research practice, but also in understanding where the gaps are, both in terms of funding, but also in terms of practice. Next slide, please. In terms of the more traditional fellowships, we know there are NIHR, MRC, ESRC, and Wellcome Trust fellowships. 
But I would also very strongly encourage you to look at local fundings. So in Scotland, we have the CSO. We also have the NHS endowment funding. We also have philanthropists who are working to further research uh, practice. I myself is an MQ fellow, and this came upon by chance. And after several meetings and, and discussions, I have been really humbled to know that MQ and charities such as MQ really invest in people uh, and, and their lives. So along with research, I would encourage you to form partnerships where uh, people are invested in you as researchers. There are also fellowship fundings through industry. So for example, Lego, NSPCC, and third sector. So look at the sort of the, the more non-traditional partnerships. We have very recently been awarded funding from the NHS to uh, employ psychiatrists who can also pursue a PhD. So have conversations with your partners wherever you are, in whichever country you are, because people are looking to fund uh, and, and, and promote talent. Uh, there's a talk later on focusing specially on fellowships where we, where, uh, we will be going into more detail uh, into some of these pathways. Next slide, please. What I would really like uh, you to know is that there are myths around research, you know, there isn't one type of a researcher. There isn't a linear pathway. There are multiple pathways of how you can pursue research. So a researcher doesn't just have to write grants, although it can be part of your role. You can be writing papers and publications, but you can also be, be involved as a collaborator. Not every uh, researcher has to perform statistical analysis and, and be involved in large data sets. There are some very talented researchers who are involved in practice and policy. You can be involved in reviewing papers. Uh, and, 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 and I would encourage you at whichever state, whether you're an early career researcher, mid-career researcher, or more senior researcher, I think involve people at different stages in reviewing your papers. Also teaching and lectureship. Uh, it can be such a rewarding experience to work with students, um, in, in, in forming collaborative partnerships. Next slide, please. So how can you enjoy research? Ask questions. It doesn't matter where you are and in what capacity, buddy up, ask for help. And, and that is in the name of good science. Be collaborative and creative. One of the biggest takeaways for me in the last 20 years has been mentorship. Having good mentors and mentees really encourages, encourages you to follow, follow research. And find teams that are encouraging of this. So within Glasgow University, Athena Swan is, a, is hugely encouraged. We have received a gold and that's because partnerships have been encouraged uh, within this forum and get papers published. This is what my mentor says, get papers published because that is really what get, promotes your research. And finally, but not lastly, rejection is really part of the process. Don't let that put you off. I can, we can have a full forum, uh, you know, on how we have continued uh, in this process despite, despite several rejections. The idea is to go back to the process, refine the process, speak to the people who would be encouraging of you and your research and follow that, those. Next slide, please. And finally, role models that are creative and collaborative in open science. These are just partnerships, not just within university, but multi-agency partnerships. That's really been encouraging of our research here within our team. We work with multi-agency partners, whether that's GPs, whether social workers, people with lived experience, it's important that we include all different voices to be multi-voice to have our research uh, experience fulfilled. Thank you very much for your time. Next slide, please. Hello, my name's um, Ian Maidment. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the incubator for inviting me to speak to you. And secondly, um, 
thank you all for coming to listen to us to speak. Um, so I'm going to talk about the non-fellowship route. Um, I'm going to talk about, I've called it no fellowship here, post-PhD and non-fellowship route. <clears throat> I'm a professor of clinical pharmacy at Aston University, um, and my email address is here below. So I'm a pharmacist by background. Next slide, please. Um, so my background is um, I spent a 20 year plus career in the NHS, mainly mental health and dementia care, but also periods in community pharmacy. So I've applied for NIHR fellowship six times, three times at doctoral level and three times at postdoctoral level. I, I've never been successful. Um, so picking up the earlier comments, we learn, build from when, we're not been, when we've not been successful. And I would say to you, there's no set route to becoming an academic. Uh, people that I've mentored and worked with have various different routes. It's not a linear journey, very, very different routes. So anyway, my journey. I published um, 40 papers um, as a clinician uh, and I couldn't get doctoral funding. So I wrote them up as a PhD by previous publication. I joined Aston as a senior lecturer on the te teaching and research contract um, actually 2012. Um, since then, I've led seven externally funded research projects. My main funders have been the NIHR. Um, so I w although they didn't fund me for the fellowships, they funded me a lot subsequently. So I would really encourage you to work out, reach out and work with the NIHR, um, engage with them. The incubators, an example, there'd be local structures as well. So what I'm going to cover is um, some of the challenges, balancing teaching and research, building research, and learning from failure. Next slide, please. OK, so um, particularly if you haven't got a fellowship, many academics are on teaching and research contracts, particularly in non-Russell group universities. Um, the difficulty with this is, both teaching and research have unlimited demands. You can always teach people more, you can always do more research. So to some degree, you're gonna to have to focus on your research to build that. Um, some ways that's easier in an institution where there's less research active staff. Um, so I've said there, learn to say no to teaching demands. What I mean by that is, if someone wants you to do research or do a research project, you can say, I can do that, but what do you want me to give up? What do you want me to stop doing? Okay, um, it's vital that academics do do teaching, but we need to balance it with the research. You're never going to be a perfect researcher and a perfect teacher. So set yourself realistic demands. And if you're going to focus on the research, focus on that, and the teacher can support that. Um, collaborate both inside and outside your institution. Don't be afraid to ask academics for support to join your grant. Um, I've always been amazed, I've emailed people um, and they often say yes. They can only say no. So if you want a co-applicant, if you want advice, email someone because they've probably been in the same position that you've been in and they've had people to help them. So in theory, they should be able to help you. So do reach out. Next slide, please. Okay, so building research. Um, I would say probably easiest to start small. So maybe look at local NHS funding, look at charities. So I'm a pharmacist, that's a pharmacy charity. There are others, obviously MQ is a mental health charity. Also look at um, the RDS, Research Design Service, do awards for PPI. Um, obviously PPI is critical for grants. Um, if you are an academic and you do a consultancy, you could probably recycle some of that via your personal research account. Research samples can, can help, but it's your research. And you've got to decide what you want to do and how you lead it. Um, you need to be focused, but you also need to be flexible to new opportunities. Then eventually, if things go okay, you, you, you're going to get your first grant, or first relatively large grant. So this was my first NIHR grant called MedRev. It was funded by Research and Patient Benefit, and I'll give some learning from that. So next slide, please. Okay, so it was uh, a feasibility study. 
it was based on my clinical experience and what I've done as a practitioner. So if you've been in practice, the good ideas will come from your practice. Um, and it was looking to see how mental health pharmacists could limit the use of psychotropics in people which are a class of medicines um, used for behaviour challenges in people living with dementia. It's been a real NHS initiative over the last 10 years. So it was linked to NHS priorities. The first thing I'll say about research, and this has been true in every study, it always takes longer than you think, and recruitment's always harder than you expect. Um, for MedRev, I didn't do this, and I should have done it. It would have been a lot easier for me. Um, use the time wisely between when funding is confirmed and the start date. You'll have a period of maybe three or four months when you can really start to get cracking on your research, start the ethics, things like that. Publish the protocol. It's an early win. When you go and speak to people about your project, you can say, look, I've got the protocol published here. You can read about it. Um, don't be afraid to ask for a no-cost extension. Um, so much of my research is qualitative. Um, ethics, in my experience, um, HRA is really designed for clinical trials. So you I think if you expect ethics is going to be challenging, you won't go far wrong. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so you, you need to develop some uniqueness, develop novelty. What does your approach bring that's different to the research landscape? Now that novelty can be both the clinical area, um, the methods, ideally both. So my novelty is um, the use of medication in the real world, particularly in at-risk populations. So there are some people doing that. There's not many, very, very few pharmacists. Secondly, um, using a realist approach. So that's a qualitative approach. And I've used that on a number of studies. Um, so there's four there. Um, so if you use the same approach methods, you could then recycle the methods from grant to grant, because they're essentially the same. Um, and you may be asked to join other grants. So I said they look for the crumbs. Um, so particularly if you're in in not a, a, a major research active institute, you only need a few grants. And once you start to get the success, it builds on it. So just, you only need one or two grants and then you'll find success will build, will build on success. Next slide, please. So learn from failure. So the fellowship's a brutal scheme. It's all or nothing. Um, it's very competitive. It's a personal award. It's about you. So you're going to take it personally. I know I certainly did. Um, I think this is true of lots of grants, but I think it's worse with the fellowship because um, you're not really established in academia, particularly pre-doctoral. There's limited support when you fail. And also when you're a junior researcher, um, you don't realise this. With all grant applications, there's an element of luck, particularly with close decisions. So the way I kind of turn it around is it's, it's not me, it's you. You as the funders, you as a panel, um, particularly for close decisions, don't see the benefit of this, of this award, this work. So take your application and apply elsewhere. Value your work. Failure, we learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. Um, thank you for listening uh, and I hope you found that useful. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Josephine Breedveld, and I am a Prudence Trust Research Fellow at King's College. Building up at, on the excellent presentations that we've had so far, my aim is really to give you a bit more detail on the opportunities for postdoctoral post mental health research uh, funding and the kind of opportunities that you can apply for and how you can apply for them kind of giving some tips around what to what kind of is um, yeah is is useful and what to think about as well as you're writing your grant application I have to um, warn you a little bit it will be a bit of a whistle stop tour and I'll share a lot of links in the slides um, this is mainly because of time but all the slides will be shared afterwards so you can uh, review everything in more detail next slide please I wanted to give you a quick overview of my own journey, um, just to highlight also in light of the previous speakers that all journeys are different. 
So for me, I previously worked uh, in mental health research charities and independent research organizations before I had my PhD and already had some experience in getting grant funding. Um, but really when I started to, when I finished uh, and defended my PhD, I started to move into um, academic research. And you can see that I had a few small grants uh, then that, that then led up to um, getting a three-year uh, Prudence Trust Fellowship into, uh, into prevention of depression and anxiety in young people. So just to highlight, this is what it was for me, but also to, to kind of tell you about the background, there were many applications that I, uh, many uh, opportunities that I applied for that were not successful. So you often see this, but you don't see all the kind of things that I didn't get, but definitely to highlight that that was there. And there is a lot of, um, yeah, there are a lot of ups and downs, I guess, in, in the journey of, uh, of getting uh, funding. Next slide, please. So where and when to start? I guess this is very individual. So I, the, the question is, where are you currently in your um, in your research journey and what would benefit you the most? So you can go for maybe a small grant, um, you can feel ready to apply for a fellowship, but you can also, um, after your PhD, join a lab uh, to get more research experience uh, before applying for other uh, funding opportunities as well. Um, and there are a few helpful links here that I would uh, recommend looking at that kind of show the different journeys um, that are available. And I will talk more about all these options uh, in the next few slides. Next slide, please. So first of all, there are the type of funding options that you can go for, but there are also a lot of different funders that you can consider when you're thinking of applying for uh, future funding for your research. So there are um, kind of research panels that you can apply to. So for example, the NIHR and UKRI, uh, UKRI has a specific research council, so I'm listing the most relevant ones here, the ESRC and the MRC. Um, and with the NIHR, um, there's, for example, there are specific schemes that might be of interest as well. Um, for example, the Research for Patient Benefits Scheme, um, which has a funding uh, limit up to 500k, but there is a 150k upper limit which is especially helpful for uh, kind of smaller uh, applications and they especially encourage early career researchers to apply there too. And then also there are more topic specific uh, charities, trusts and foundations. So you can see a list here. Um, I want to specifically mention the MQ because um, their research lead, Parisa Mansouri, is here um, and she will be also uh, a panel member uh, for the Q&A in case you have any specific questions for her. Next slide, please. So there are, in terms of going back to the kind of different opportunities depending on, on where you are in your journey. There are small grants um, that you can apply to that can be specifically helpful if you want to get some preliminary data for a bigger grant application or for a fellowship application, or if you want to build a network or if you want to uh, look at getting some uh, additional um, experience or training uh, into specific areas. So um, Rachel later on will be presenting on travel and training awards. But so looking at kind of smaller grants, you can um, go to potentially your university might have some funding. Um, there is uh, the research design uh, service that might have some funding charities. Um, and also the NIHR applied research collaborations. And I think the key here is um, yeah, just to see, kind of think about what you need and what the specific funders can offer. So if you want, for example, some funding for um, maybe uh, lived experience involvement or maybe setting up a young people's advisory group, uh, there might be specific uh, grants, uh, specific funders that have an opportunity for that. Um, so next slide, please. Then there are the fellowships and awards that you can go for. Here is a list of the fellowships that we identified as a group. And I think the key here, the key message here is to find a fellowship that really matches your research, that links 
in very closely to what you're currently doing. And uh, because they all have a slightly different remit, some are funding more translational research, some are funding more basic research, um, and there are a range of opportunities. And I would definitely encourage you to uh, look at these links uh, and see, and also the different funders and see what fits the best with you. Um, and there are also international opportunities, uh, which I've listed here. And you might also want to have a look at the International Alliance for Mental Health Research Funders, which shows you the uh, research funders internationally that fund uh, mental health research um, in case they might also have uh, opportunities there. Um, I'm mindful, I, I wish I could go into this in a bit more detail, but I hope that, uh, you know, by looking at the, the links and maybe asking any questions in the Q&A, you can, uh, you can, this, this will be a helpful starting point. Next slide, please. So then we're going to kind of organizing your time before you actually apply for a fellowship or a grant. And this is um, a very, very helpful timeline that I uh, received from um, Rachel, which is, and, and I I, I, I empathize a lot with it and I, I recognize a lot of it because I think it's very, very key to think very early in advance um, about the opportunity and then putting all the plans in place before applying and having a bit of a timeline for yourself. So around nine months before, um, maybe start to identify a fund or think about your ID, discuss it with colleagues and collaborators um, and then I think from a personal perspective where I, well, what, what is a learning point for me, I think, is to really make sure that you request the partner budgets or any budget that you want to, from a partner that you want to include in your application, request it early and also um, allow sufficient time for kind of sign off on budgets, as well as allowing sufficient time for um, collaborators to review it because, there can be quite a bit of back and forth. Um, so I think this is this is just helpful to keep in mind as you start to think about these uh, these opportunities. Okay, next slide, please. And finally, um, some other tips for writing a good grant application. Uh, i've I've singled out fellowships here specifically, which is uh, in in many of the applications, they ask for kind of details on why you're the right person in the right place and have the right project for this uh, specific opportunity. Um, so that is useful to keep in mind how all these factors can come together to make you the kind of ideal candidate for a fellowship. And also importantly, and which kind of links to previously what I mentioned around funding is to talk about your personal trajectory and how your funding contributes to your, your journey. Um, and I think that links very well with the uh, other presenters so far that it's it's about kind of the journey and how funding can help you get to uh, to where you want to go to. So I think that's important to highlight as well in an application. Um, and then a lot of uh, kind of other tips uh, and that that you can have a look at, which uh, is very specifically around you know when you apply for something, make sure that there is a clear um, rationale, make sure you're clear about what you're asking, make sure that there is like a clear lineage throughout your application around kind of, a, kind of a common thread of how the rationale fits into the methods, fits into the outputs uh, of your research as well. And um, there is a really great webinar that you can look at. There is a link here that goes into much more detail than this. So thank you very much for uh for your time and for listening and that's it for me thank you so much josephine loads of really interesting funding tips and advice there um of course it's not all about the money though or that can often feel particularly important the funding and, and the next steps and, and next sort of job role but there are lots of other things as well that you could be doing to develop your career postdoctorally and so we wanted to finish off by, by thinking about some of those before we move into the q a um, but do please get thinking about any questions you've got for any of us and posting those in the q a bit whilst i'm talking now because we'll come to that bit next um, next slide please 
Um, so the first thing I'd say in terms of other things you can do, and I think you've heard a little bit of this from the speakers along the way as well, is is to work with others. You don't need to do this alone. And actually working with other people is just really valuable. That could be working with others in terms of developing ideas or, or taking on different aspects of, of the work involved and the next steps for you. Um, it might be in terms of ideas, in terms of grant or fellowship application writing, in terms of writing articles, whatever it is. But if, if you work with others, your, your next steps and the work is likely to progress more quickly and to be of a better standard as well, because you're all drawing on each other's strengths then. Um, I, I've really come to learn that, that who you know can be more helpful than, than what you know and perhaps it shouldn't be like that but that has often been the case for me in practice there's lots of things I've been invited to do or opportunities that have come my way that have been because they've come from someone who I already know so I, I think it's really important to be working with others and collaborating and networking because that's where some of the opportunities that help you develop your career come from that said something else I've learned and I'm sure others have too it is that it's really important to choose wisely who you work with. So I have been really lucky and I've worked with some really supportive, nice people who have taken an interest in my career and really helped me develop. There have been some times when I've worked with some people or I certainly know of other people where that hasn't always been the case and that I've heard of some people who've had much less good experiences. So I think it is really worth being mindful of who you work with and perhaps checking people out beforehand or just making some initial introductions but not fully agreeing to work together until you have a sense of whether you can work well with that person life's too short to work with people who aren't nice um in terms then of, of how you might go about building those networks and collaborations in practice obviously you can look inside your institution and it might be easier to connect with with people you're already working with or, or close to but you can also very much look outside your workplace and, and there's actually lots of different ways of connecting with, with people working elsewhere. So that might be via conferences or other events or social media. Um, it could be by contacting existing research centres or departments that are working in an area you're interested in and just saying that you're interested and is there anything you might be able to do together or arranging a visit. Um, there's lots of networks and resources around as well, like the incubator map that I'll show you a bit more about in a second, but loads of networks across the country as well that are focused either specifically on mental health research or on related aspects and are great things to get involved with. Um, and, and, and think strategically as well. So if you're going to a conference, for example, have a look a few weeks before and see who's going that you might want to speak to. And, and why not drop them a quick email beforehand so you've, you've already sort of made that initial introduction rather than trying to catch someone cold on the day. If you could arrange to have a quick coffee with someone or say it'd be good to catch up, you've made that first step already, haven't you? Uh, next slide, please. So in terms then of thinking about sort of networks in particular, there are actually quite a lot of uh, different ways that you could find people, um, perhaps outside of those you're immediately working with. So locally, as, as well as local research centres, that your local R&D department could be a really good place to go. They want to support research, so they will know who else is working in that area and be keen to bring you together. But on a, a regional and national level, there's just a few examples on the slide there of lots of networks that, that exist already and some with a specific mental health focus that you could become part of and would be great for a CV building purpose and also for building networks and collaborations. And I've mentioned the incubator map as well. There's a screenshot on the right there of, of what it looks like. Each one of those blobs represents a researcher working in mental health research in the UK. If you were to zoom in, there's actually a lot more blobs than you can see there. Um, so those are all people working in areas, some of which you may be working in very similar areas too that you could get in touch with. Or why not add yourself to the map? And they can then be getting in touch with you. Next slide, please. So next up is mentoring which has been mentioned briefly already but that can be another really great way to think about where are you now and what might be good next steps for you from someone who's already been there and and, and knows what might be sensible things to do and what sorts of opportunities there may be for you and that could be more of an informal or a formal arrangement either is okay and both exist so more formally that might be that your institution uh, has a mentoring scheme, for example, quite a lot do, and you could find out more about that. Or there are um, national schemes available to people with certain funding 
um, held as well. So the Academy of Medical Sciences, for example, has a mentorship scheme. And so does the NIHR for anyone with one of their fellowships or awards. Um, but you could also approach people directly yourself. Um, you know, maybe, again, choose wisely. Think about people who you admire or have done those next steps already and you'd quite like to follow a similar approach to them or people you think will give good advice. Um, and if you don't ask, you don't get. Again, as Ian said before, the worst they can say is no, but they may well say, yes, I'd be happy to have a chat with you. And I found some of those conversations really helpful. The other thing I've learned to say it's really important to think about what you want to get out of that conversation and go prepared beforehand. And the Academy of Medical Sciences, I've put a link to there, has some really great advice around thinking about how to get the most out of mentoring conversations. Next slide, please. There are loads of other things as well that you could be thinking about doing. And here are just some examples. Um, something I found really helpful is gaining experience of reviewing grant applications. It's just such a great way to get a sense of what makes a good application, what makes an application e easy for a reviewer to read, what are the common pitfalls and making sure that you avoid those then. So starting to get experience of reviewing grant applications might be something that's really helpful for you. And you know, maybe someone in your, your network that you've built could help you with getting the first opportunities to do that. Think about what, what panels, committees or networks you could join. Um, they could be topic or mental health specific. Um, for example, your local trust may have a, a working group focused on the, the, the issue that, or um, topic of mental health that you're interested in. They could be academic or, or grant funding committees, for example. So a range of different things, but great for networking and getting experience and great for your CV. Lots of what we're talking about, applying for, for funding, writing it up afterwards obviously involves a lot of writing so something else I find really helpful is a writing retreats or writing days and, and there are lots of different options for that you could set one up yourself and just do it online you could pay to attend one there might be ones run at your organization but that's a great way to carve out some time to say today I am just writing and you can put an out of office on your email as well and just focus your time because it's hard to find that time sometimes Look out for early career research networks as well. I found those really helpful. So a group of people at a similar stage, um, thinking postdoctorally about what to do next. You can learn off each other. You can work together on applications or just share tips and things. You can invite speakers um, that will help you with your career development aims and what you want to do next. Being part of a network, it has lots and lots of benefits. Um, and again, as Josephine mentioned before, there are loads of funding opportunities that are around training or career development. So it doesn't have to be funding for a grant application. Look at um, the GROW programme I mentioned, for example, there's a link there. But there are lots of grants for training, for travel, for all sorts of different things that will, will help you um, with the next steps in your career. Next slide, please. So I've just run really briefly through lots of different things you could do, but how do you prioritize that? What are the most important things? And, and that might be something you just need to think about yourself because part of that is about you. What are you interested in? What are sensible next steps for you? But something else I found really helpful is, is actually looking at the promotion requirements for the next grade or so up from where you're working at the moment. Um, someone advised me to do this a long time ago and I took a little while before I did it and then realized what great advice it was. Um, here, I've, I've just put an example of what sort of criteria you might be asked to fulfill if you're applying for a senior research fellow. But you can see there that there's sort of about six criteria um, some of those are things that you might have expected to be there and are things that we've already talked about. But there are also other things um, that, that might be less obvious initially, but are things that we've talked about today. So national standing, for example, being around committee or grant panel membership or networks or collaborations that you've built. Next slide, please. And the last thing I wanted to say before we move on to the Q&A is just that um, here's a final example then of, of what sort of my career progression has looked like post PhD so far. Again, I'm not leaving that there for you to be able to look at all of it now, but just a couple of things I wanted to point out was first, again, there are some things circled in red that I didn't get. You wouldn't see those on my CV, but important to say I've had you know at least a couple of funding applications not that I've not had. I've had two jobs that I didn't get. 
Um, you can also see that the money and the orange um, builds over time. So it's really important to know you can apply for short amounts to start with and bigger amounts can come later. That's absolutely fine. But there's loads of other stuff on the right that I've done that's been really helpful. Being a member of funding panel committees, but other things as well, being part of the incubator, for example. So lots of things that have helped me get to where I am now. Um, that was all I was going to say for now, because I want to give you the chance to ask some questions. So I will hand over to B, who's going to chair the Q&A segment of the webinar. Great. Hi, all, And um, thanks, thanks to all the panel for um, such informative, um, useful presentations and sharing, sharing really, really valuable experience um, with everyone. Um, we we'll really, really appreciate that. Um, so the panel have done a, a brilliant job um, during the presentations, um, answering some of the questions that have come through um, in, uh, in text answers. Um, so, let, um, but do do keep adding your your questions. Uh, we've got um, yeah 12, 12 minutes now to, to the end of the webinar, and do upvote them if you want a um, an answer um, to a particular question. You, you have the same question. So. Um, yeah, the, the question that we have in the Q&A at the moment. Um, thank you for all your great advice. Any advice on balancing career and financial stability as a postdoc with other aspects of life coming up, e.g. having a family? Um, so a really relevant question, I think, that to uh, probably a lot of people here. Obviously, academia can be unpredictable. Is there a particular postdoc route that can be the most stable or predictable or more on you parent friendly? Um, is anyone of the panel able to take that? Rachel? I'm happy to make a start, but very happy for the people to join in. I think that's a really important question. Uh, Richka mentioned earlier that she'd taken maternity leave. I also took maternity leave twice um, during my PhD. What I found really helpful is working with people who understand that we all have lives outside of our jobs. And so being really mindful again about who you work with, I think, rather than there being necessarily one particular route for me. That, that's the most helpful but I work with people who understand that sometimes young children become sick they get ill they suddenly sports day is rearranged at short notice and I am able to flex my work um, when I need to, to to fit those other things in and, and that for me makes the biggest difference um, Ian you've got your hand up too and there might be other things you wanted to say there I think it's a real challenge I think academia is not family friendly first or life friendly particularly postdocs, when you're postdocs, when you're going from one contract to another, um, it's a real challenge. The most stable are obviously teaching and research contracts, but then the risk is the teaching will overwhelm you, or a fellowship, where you're probably going to get four or five years funding. Um, I mean, this is something which uh, academia and the funders need to improve, because it's not, it's not family friendly for postdocs, where you work on a project for two years, and then yeah, it, my advice would be to um, choose your project carefully and um, choose the people you work with carefully and ask them what it, when you go for the interview is what are the opportunities when the project finishes. Um, but it's a real challenge. Um, yeah, no, it is. And we lose a lot of really good researchers because there's no continuity of employment or it's difficult to get it or it can be. Yeah, I'd agree as well. It's that that not one contract coming to an end and knowing beforehand that's coming is really stressful, particularly if you work part time to juggle childcare because you don't necessarily know that the next job will will have the same hours and the same days. It 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 is really tricky. Uh, sometimes I think fellowships are helpful for that because you can apply to do them part time and you have more control over your work and when you do it. Then so that is something worth considering, I think. And I've always found the NHR, for example, I can remember just saying, I'm I'm, I'm need going to need to take turn to leave, and they just said that's okay. Yeah, that was basically the end of that discussion. It was very easy. Great, that's great to know. Thank you. Um, excellent, right, Ian. So, um, other questions, Dr. Bullock. Um, apologies um, for a silly question. No silly questions, so um, don't worry about that. But um, so panel able to um, answer what's the salary of a fellowship? Um, so this attendee is unsure how it's calculated. Not able to answer. Oh, we've got um, Ian's able to, to answer this. We'll take this one. Okay, I can answer it. My hand's up from a previous question. Oh, I, can, I can still answer it. So usually it's based on your previous salary. So usually your fellowship would be based on um, 
So if you were working in the NHS as a, um, a nurse or a pharmacist, it should be based on your salary in the NHS with on cost. Um, and the same if you're working as, a, as an academic as well. So the salary cost will be based on your last job, but you can include increments. So you can include increments up the um, NHS's agenda for change, up the agenda for change scale, basically. Thanks, Ian. We've also got um, Tanya from NIHR um, who's, um, who'd like to answer this, this question as well. So Tanya? No, apologies. I'm just making sure that it disappears after it's been answered. Uh, oh, okay. Um, any, anyone else in the panel uh, want to, to volunteer an answer for that, that question? Thanks very much to Ian. Um, okay, let's, we've got time for some more questions and we have some more. So um, a question about dealing with rejection. So this is something that um, will be relevant to um, a lot of people and um, given given how how this um, how this works so um redealing with rejections our fund is generally open to providing feedback on applications in fact is it worth asking for feedback given the requirements can differ so much josephine yes i would say yes and especially if you've submitted a full application so through the pre-proposal stage and you've submitted a full application funders usually provide feedback and also I think it is worth asking I think it's definitely worth asking to hear what has gone what what where you can improve and how you can improve on a future application as well and 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 funders do provide that in my experience um so agree um I would support asking for it oh and and um Rachel and Lushika um Rachel would you like to I was just going to say something else that I always recommend people do when they are applying for for um, fellowships and funding is to look at who's on the panel that they may already know because that person will have a conflict of interest and won't be able to sit in on their discussion anyway. So it's someone really useful to get in touch with to have a discussion when you're applying for how to put together a good application. But it's also, also useful at this point of rejection as well. So you will get some feedback written. Um, but sometimes it can be hard to read between the lines and know quite what that feedback really means in terms of where perhaps your application didn't quite hit the mark for that particular panel. Going back to somebody who sits on that panel who wasn't involved in that discussion but knows how to read between those lines will be able to help you with unpicking where perhaps you might be able to tweak or change things to, to, to fit with some of the reasons it's been rejected. So that's something else I would suggest doing. Uh, Ruchika, you, you might want to add to that as well. Oh, I was just going to add that get this might be obvious, but get different people to look at your application before submitting it. Different pairs of eyes. You've read it so many times. You know, sometimes the obvious misses, and get people from different professions uh, to have a look at it because your reviewers aren't always going to be from your profession. So, having a lay summary, but also having uh, a summary that's read by different professionals, and and it's easy to take rejection personally. You know, we we, we all do it because. You know, we've written it, we've put our heart and soul, but actually sometimes you've just not met the remit for what the call is. That doesn't mean your application is bad or or, or perhaps sometimes you just got to improve it. So uh, before applying to MQ, I submitted the application elsewhere. And I'm, I'm really glad that was rejected because it just meant that we had to refine it and broaden the scope. Uh, so don't don't always take rejection personally, although it's it's easier said than done. Thank you, Sheila. So we've got a, another question here uh, that Rachel would like to answer. Is it possible to secure a permanent position as a researcher in academia or would teaching have to be involved? Rachel, are you... Um... I, I said I wanted to answer that because the short answer is yes, because I've got one. So I know they do exist, but they are also like, is the phrase hen's teeth? Very rare. Um, so I am really lucky that I have a predominantly research focused permanent position I didn't have that to start with the job was initially advertised as a one-year post and I took a risk to apply for it but it became made permanent I only do a very small amount of teaching and it gives me lots of time to focus on my research but they are few and far between um, it's maybe worth mentioning that I have that at a non-Russell Group university so I previously worked at a Russell Group university where I was on a series of, of six of fixed term contracts um, and 
that's why I, I, I looked to move in the end because I was fed up of that and working at a non-muscle group post 92 university has been much more flexible in terms of my particular employment and that's how this opportunity has come up for me I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that but that's my experience they do exist but they're rare would anyone else on the panel like to add to that yeah Ian they are quite hard um so you the, the the obvious route is a fellowship where you've got the funding and you're taking it to university um otherwise you're kind of working on someone else's project um as a postdoc um i do do predominantly do research but i've changed it gradually over time so i started on a tnr contract as i was more teaching and research as i was more successful with research um i could use funding for research to backfill my teaching. So my research aspect expanded um, and my, it backfilled my teacher. Um, I agree with Rachel in a way, um, I'm at a non-Russell Group University and it's perhaps because um, in terms of my institution, I'm relatively successful in terms of research. It's easier to justify um, doing more research if that makes sense. Um, so th there aren't many jobs advertised as just research. If they are, they're usually a postdoc and you're a research associate on someone else's project. And that's maybe a two or three year contract. But it's unusual to have like um, a research post, come to us and do your own research with no funding. That's not that common. Thanks Ian. I think we've just got time for one last um, question now. Um, and we've got a couple of people who are interested in this question. Um, and who'd like some advice um, as a disabled postdoc um, and experience, any um, experiences, um, advice that the panel can share about postdoc careers as a disabled person who can't always attend in person and needs more flexibility. Does any any member of the panel have any thoughts on that? Quickly we're running on to the end of time, Rachel. Uh, certainly it's possible. Again, I think it's about choosing wisely and asking early on these kinds of things, certainly where I work at the moment. And again, because my role is predominantly research focused, I work from home a lot. This this is my, my regular place of being, uh, which, which makes things very, very flexible um, for me. Um, that's not always the case. It, it varies a bit by institution since COVID. And I found that some institutions, because I do work across two, have more requirements in terms of people being in place in the workplace now. So I think it's, again, it's something to check out um, when you're thinking of applying somewhere. Um, I certainly am able to work from home a lot of the time, but not all of the time. I probably go in about once a week or so when it's not teaching, when I am teaching, I mean. So if anyone else wants to add to that. Um, so yeah, definitely it depends on the institution, but from the funders perspective, funding panels usually take into account these considerations, any flexibility, um, caring responsibility, disability that the applicant might have, and they actually encourage applicants to do mention it in their um, proposal or, or covering letter, and just to make sure that the pro project that they are proposing will be feasible um, under the circumstances that they want to work um, with. Great. Thank you very much. We have to um, to, to finish there. So all, all the time, um, uh, all the questions we have time for. Um, we um, thank so much to, to the panel for your presentations, to everyone for coming and, and contributing to um, a really uh, interesting, useful discussion. We'll be sharing the slides and um, and the presentations uh, later later this week. And as I've uh, indicated in the chat, there's lots of resources on the incubator website uh, to support you. Um, so um, do get involved and stay in touch. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming, everyone.